Now, um, I'm going to be sharing today a part of it, a bit of my experience as a son and also uh, a bit of my experience as a father, limited experience in both ways. Uh, but more importantly, I'd like you to hear um, the word of God to us. I really like us to listen to what God wants to say to each of us. Um, he has, he's the one who's, been, who's placed us in our families, and he has a word for each of us today. So that's the most important word I'd like us to, to hear today. Uh, would you turn your Bible with me to Proverbs 23? And uh, in Proverbs 23, we're going to be looking at a couple of verses in the middle of that um, proverb, in the middle of that passage. If you're interested in numbers, uh, it's very easy to memorize these references. Proverbs 23, verse 24, 25, and 26. And oh Lord, would you just open our hearts and our minds and our ears uh, to you today as you send forth your word into our very lives. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Spirit. Amen. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice. And he who fathers a wise son will be glad in him. Let your father and your mother be glad. Let her who bore you rejoice. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe or delight in my way. Now we know that the words father here also include mothers and the words sons here also include daughters. So verse 24 would easily read, the mother of the righteous would greatly rejoice and, he who, and she who mothers a wise daughter will be glad in her. And so for the rest of today, uh, this couple of minutes, we're going to be talking about parents and children in general. And I'd like us to just linger on verse 25 for a little bit. Oh, let your father and mother be glad. Let her, let him who gave you birth rejoice. Each of us here are sons and daughters, and some of us here are fathers and mothers. Isn't this verse what every child longs for? That we will know that our parents are glad over us, rejoice over us. Isn't this what also every parent would love? To have joy over their children, not heartache and pain. And you know, God loves this the most. Um, he is the one who made families. Um, and He, of all people, longs that families be glad and families rejoice. You know, this verse 25 is true of Jesus. I like you to think about Jesus and his earthly parents, Joseph and Mary. And also like you to think about this heavenly, this spiritual father, God Almighty. Matthew 3.17 records for us before the public ministry of Jesus Christ, okay? Before Jesus has done anything in the ministry, in the, in, in the area of, of, of Israel, before that has happened at his baptism, Matthew 3.17 tells us a voice was heard from heaven by him and others around. And this is what the voice said. This is what God the Father said. This is my son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Wow. This is my son, for the earth, whom I love. What sing I 
and with him I am well pleased. And you know, this is not the only time that God the Father would say this again in an audible voice that others, that Jesus' disciples could hear in Matthew 17, verse 5. On a mountain, while Jesus was still speaking, a bright cloud surrounded Jesus and his disciples, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And now this is happening midway, around year three, still before the crucifixion of Jesus, around year three of his life in public ministry, but yet before he's completed the work that God had sent him to do, which is the cross. Jesus hears again his father declaring over him, My son, I love you. With you, I greatly rejoice. I am well pleased. So, you know, the son who fulfills this verse 25 the best, the child who, re- who fulfills this verse the best is Jesus. And for all of us, therefore, sons and daughters, not only of God, but sons and daughters of earthly parents, then Jesus really is our model and our example. What about Jesus? made God the Father rejoice over him or so pleased with him. We know it's not just about what Jesus did because even before he did it, the Father, God, his Father was pleased already. So it's not just about doing. Verse 24 gives us the clues and tells us the answers, in fact, that it is righteousness, and wisdom in a child that make parents glad. God the Father was pleased, was glad, and rejoiced over Jesus just by his being, him being righteous, him being wise. Now you also notice that these two words, righteous and wise, are also kind of doing words. They are being and behavior words because you know a person is righteous from what they do and you also know a person is not internally from what they see and choose how to do that. I'd like to take some time here to unpack for us a little bit what righteousness and wisdom mean and we can describe it this way that righteousness is excellence of virtue. It's outstanding character, values. It's goodness. It's a, it's a perfect reflection of God. That's what Christ says. To get out in virtue. And wisdom, wisdom we can say is excellence in discernment or in judgment or in choosing or in perceiving and doing. Wisdom is best seen in excellence of choices. This is being perfectly mine to the Father's wisdom, thoughts, and ways. Of us when we pause and think now as children. How do we bring our parents the greatest joy and the least pain, sorrow, or heartache? Would you not agree that we would give our personal joy and pleasure? Not to mention pride and gratefulness and so many other positive feelings if we are children who excel in virtue and excel in choices. For me, when I think about this, I know that my dad and my mom and my mother-in-law would be more pleased if I spoke kindly to them instead of harshly, 
then if I gave them all the wealth of the world, or for that matter, the, the wealth of their have or the allowance or the love gift or whatever, you know, all the human benefit I can offer to my parents cannot remove the pain of a harsh, cynical, sarcastic word. That's what it means to excel in virtue that brings parents joy. Our parents will be so pleased and so glad to rejoice with us if they see us making choices, talking about excellence of choices, wisdom, if we live wisely, choosing how we spend our time, how we make our money, how we live our life according to the ways of God and His Word and His, and His wisdom, much more than if we were grand, great achievers of things in life. Um, so I'll get us to think about this. That just as the way that the Son of Sons, Jesus Christ, gives His Father so much pleasure and joy because of His rightness of character in and out, and because of His wisdom, His deep respect and fear of His Father, His God, who, who gives Him the ways to go and the thoughts to think, because of His excellence of His living of His choices, so too for us, we can bring our parents the greatest joys, the greatest pleasures, the greatest gladness by our righteousness and our wisdom. In other words, by our Christ likeness. I'd like you to know that this is going to be true also for those of us who have parents who are non Christians. Even if our parents are non-Christians, no parent has truly condemned love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control that they see in their child. In fact, Galatians 5.22 tells us, against such things, there is no law. There's no religion. There's no faith background. There's no... There, no one would truly reject these things. Instead, when we demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit, we actually bring our parents closer to knowing the true God, the true Father, who is their Father as well. And even if our parents have passed on, there are many of us here listening in whose parents have already passed on. You know, even though we're not necessarily able to bring them joy and gladness right now, yet we are bringing joy and pleasure and gladness and pain not to them only, but to other people around us when we are righteous and when we are wise, when we excel in our virtue and excel in our choices. Think of it as a legacy of bringing our parents joy, that we can bring others around us joy. Until today, People still talk about my age. And this is a strong arrow between A and our two kids with their comfort. This is a legacy. And then me and when the children demonstrate wisdom and demonstrate righteousness, it's a living legacy of how they bring their own father and grandfather joy. And so my encouragement to us today. My plea to us today is that we would be sons and daughters who bring our parents joy because of our Christ-likeness in righteousness and in wisdom. Let us increase in Christ-likeness as we allow God to disciple us. As he shows us, as he teaches us, as he rebukes us even, as he corrects, guides and changes us, trains us in righteousness so that the man and the woman of God, the growing up children of God may be complete. This is Paul's prayer uh, for Timothy in 2 Timothy 3. And so may you and I grow 
starting today even, knowing now how we bring our parents and how we bring people around us and how we bring our spiritual father, God himself, joy, just like Jesus, because we flourish, we overflow with goodness of character and greatness of wisdom. O oh Lord, do this in our lives, that we may bring you glory and bring our families also glory. Before we move on to the other verse, verse 26, that is there we haven't yet looked at, I want to point out one more word in verse 24, and that is the word fathers. Now, when you read this, Verse 24, you know that that word there, he who fathers a wise son. Now you know that that's an active word. Fathers is a verb, it's an action word. And it points to a parent's, both a father and a mother's active involvement in a son's and daughter's life over a period of time. In fact, over a long time, possibly even a lifetime. Because it takes time to nurture righteousness and wisdom in people and it takes time to sustain it as well. This is not a sentence that says, oh, just because we gave birth to a child who eventually becomes righteous and wise, then yay, hooray, good job. But this is a, a sentence that says we are involved in that journey. And uh, there's something here about it. Uh, for us. So let's turn our attention now a little bit to parenting. How shall we raise children who become righteous and wise? For the joy of many, not just ourselves, but even joy of people around, for the pleasure of others and for God's joy. How do we parent our own children or the other children in our care? Uh, some of these children will be children that we take care of at home. They could be your nieces or your nephews. They could be children that we take care of in school. Uh, many of us here still have children in school because we teach in primary schools, right? And even we can extend that question to how do we parent, spiritually parent, how do we disciple make? How do we mature or shepherd people under our care, under our charge, such that these people who follow after us, blood children, entrusted children, spiritual children, how do we do parenting such that we would nurture righteousness and wisdom in them? And here's where verse 26 comes in. And verse 26 says really interesting stuff. It says, My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe or let your eyes delight in my ways. The reason why there's a translation choice of two words there is because the original Hebrew word has both meanings that let you see and be glad in what I am doing. Something here speaks about the entrusting, the giving of hearts to one another, the joining of hearts. And in the Hebrew understanding, in the Hebrew tradition, heart is not just about emotions, good feelings, it's not. The Bible speaks of heart as the inner person. So the mind, the way that we think, the way that we feel, and even our will, our motivation, these three things, mind, heart, and will, thoughts, emotion, and motivations, these make up the heart of a person. And so the Hebrew will understand this, my son, be joined in me in your thinking, be joined in me in your feeling, be joined with me in your motivations for all that you do. And secondly, let your eyes observe, let your eyes see, 
and delight in my ways. It's an inclusion of the young or those who follow after us into our lives. And it's an inclusion in such a way that the young will be glad to be involved. This is not the situation where a parent drags a sulky teenager along for some activity that they don't really want to be involved in. This is a glad joining of hearts and joining of lives. When we look at the father of fathers, God, and when we look at the son of sons, Jesus, we see exactly this. We see that both their thoughts, both their emotions, both their motivations, both their lives, their actions, everything about them was fully joined. And we know the Bible tells us they were joined in by, through the Spirit. In fact, we use the word today still that we are one in spirit if we have exactly the same thoughts, feelings, excitement over something. Like a soccer, a fair fans of a soccer team have the same spirit like, yeah, go Liverpool! We use the same word spirit to describe this joining of hearts and joining even of lives. In John 5, 19 and 20, Jesus said, I do only what I see my father doing. And my father loves me. And my father shows me all that he is doing. I do what I see my father doing. My father loves me and he shows me all that he is doing. Can we be and do this also with our children and our disciples just as Abba, our Father, does with Jesus and does with us? Yes, we can. The same spirit between them is the spirit who is in us, the Holy Spirit. And as Abba, Father, is to me, I can be to my children, my disciples, so that our hearts and our lives will be joined and our righteousness and wisdom is nurtured. I just want to pause briefly because that's a lot of thoughts happening at once. Because only as far as we understand God being this to us, can we truly replicate this for others. A good friend and a children's, experienced children's minister um, shared with us parents who asked, how do we disciple our children? And he says, you don't need to worry whether you're a first generation Christian, never had discipling before by a Christian parent, or you're second generation or third generation, you don't need to think about all that history first. How you are discipled by Jesus today, how you let God disciple you today is the biggest help for how you will disciple your children tomorrow. How am I discipled by God is how I will disciple my children, the children under our care, the young under our care, or even those spiritual children, our disciples, our mentors who are following after us. And so when I think about how God disciples me, here's a list that I drew up this week. And it's interesting actually, if we took time, all these things that I'm going to say are also found in the same few verses going up and down in Proverbs 22, 23, and 24. Those three chapters of Proverbs that make up the wise sayings. The 30 wise sayings. But here's my list I want to share with you, and let's see whether you agree with this too in your life. This is how my spiritual father, Abba, God, disciples me. This is how he nurtures righteousness and wisdom, excellence of virtue, and excellence of choice in me. First, 
He loves me deeply. That just goes without saying, right? Love is the first place in which hearts are joined. I notice that God is also very present and very responsive to me. God protects and provides for me very sacrificially. He lays down so much just to give me what I need, bless me with what I long for, I hope for, and to defend and to protect me. My Heavenly Father helps me so much, especially when I'm weak, when I'm unable, and when I'm oppressed. My Heavenly Father teaches me that I might grow in ability and therefore be empowered to live fairly independently. He counsels me for my future well-being. He disciplines me for my good. And he constantly and frequently, frequently points me to him. The source of all my life. I'm glad to say that at this point in my life, I can reflect and say that many, perhaps all of these things have been true of me, not just God doing for me, but my parents, my dad, my mom, my earthly parents have done this for me. And so, in course, in due time, as they have fathered and mothered me, there has developed some measure of rightness, some measure of wisdom. The list goes on, you know. God reveals his thoughts and feelings to me. Just as he did with Abraham and Moses. God reveals and lets me see his ways he shows me, gives me understanding what's going on. And he has personal, intimate conversations together with me. He helps me to delight in his sovereign, greater, higher ways. If it's a, a list that's too long to digest, I summarize it with three words. That my heavenly father and in many ways, my earthly father and mother, my mentors that I look up to, my physical and my spiritual parents are admirable, they are approachable, and they are authentic. If we can parent with these three big ideas in mind, that we ourselves are admirable because of our righteousness and our wisdom, if we are approachable because of the way we tenderly shepherd, care, join our hearts and thoughts and lives, if we can be authentic, which is taking again that joining of lives super deep, you see what I'm involved in, how I live. I involve you with my thought process, my emotional experiences and even my day-to-day -day actions. If we are admirable, approachable, and authentic parents, I'm certain that our children and those whom we shepherd would more gladly connect with us about their thoughts, their emotions, and their motivations. They would let us into their lives as we let them into ours. And therefore, with joint hearts and lives, the excellence of virtues and choices will become true in time for everyone's joy. So I want to sum up by saying that Proverbs 23 is also exhorting, encouraging us strongly to be parents and disciple makers who are children and our disciples 
would join themselves too gladly because we have included them in our godly lives. Even as we become ourselves more and more like our Heavenly Father. These two calls, exhortations to us today can be really, can feel like a really huge, really daunting, or even overwhelming, impossible, or for some of us, hopeless. But before that thought sets into your mind, I'd like to tell you that God says, no, that's not true. It's not too late, it's not impossible, and it's not hopeless to live this out. Even though, yes, we know, the Bible says, do this early, start this early, train up a child in the way that he should go. Even if we miss those opportunities, Right now, today, it's not too late, it's not impossible, it's not hopeless. Because in Malachi 4, 6, and that's a totally different Bible study in itself, because there, God declares that every single change that we make now, by the power of God, can recover lost years and heal perfect, imperfect, or even ruined relationships. Malachi 4, 6, in the bleakest of situations, God declares through his messenger, the prophet Malachi, that every bit of his people's change, repentance, will release a blessing from him of restored family relationships. This promise already started to prove true and was recorded and echoed by Luke in Acts chapter 3, verse 19 and 20. So I want to urge us today all to hear our Lord speak what he has said to us, to be of strong heart, and to begin some of these changes that he's already nudging you towards today, that we may be sons and daughters to give our parents joy because of our Christ-likeness, in righteousness and wisdom. And that we would also be parents and disciple makers whom our children, disciples, would gladly join themselves to because we have included them in our ever increasing godly lives. Here is word to us today. Take courage. And let's walk into the blessing that he has for our families today and for many, many years to come. By the way, today, 22nd of November, is Grandparents' Day. Did you know that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Google informed me that 22nd of November is Grandparents' Day. So, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God for showing us what family can be like because you were the perfect son of righteousness and wisdom. And God, you were the perfect father who joined hearts and lives with your son. I pray, Lord, that today, having a glimpse of that in our lives, you will, by your power, by your spirit, that join you and your son together, to join us together with our families. Can I invite you now, church, just to take a few moments with me to pray. And I just invite you to enjoy the fact that you are a son and a daughter in God's family, in his household. I'm not just talking about the church, I'm talking about that if you have Yahweh 
the almighty sovereign God as your father, your perfect father. And you have Jesus Christ as your brother, according to scripture. Would you just thank him for that now? We sang a song a couple of weeks ago. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I am a child of God. And if today your understanding of being a child of God does not bring you to an overwhelming emotional, mental, and life-changing response. I want to urge you to give this attention. In the days and the weeks to come, seek out someone who speaks richly about how they know God as their own parent and Jesus as their own sibling. And journey with them for a bit to let them kind of show you how amazing and rich it is to be a child of God. And if the term child of God is foreign to you today, it's something that you have not ever thought about using on yourself. Then I also want to invite you to seek out someone who is a child of God and who can introduce you to this relationship with God. Now, very quickly, I want to invite us to move along in our prayer, your own prayer time now, to start to pray about your family. I hope you'll be able to start with thanksgiving for your family. Find something that you can thank God for for your family. And then as the Spirit of God in you leads you, pray in accordance to His Spirit's guidance for your family, about your family, over your family. You're a priest of the great Almighty God. And you can bring blessing to your family because you know Him. So be that channel today as you pray for your family. Even before we talk about doing anything for our family, let's pray first. And let God lead us then into our change of minds and hearts and then actions also. Let's just pray for our family. So Father of Fathers, from whom all families derive our pattern and our names,
the request will be asked of you, knowing it is upon your heart, knowing it is in your will. Lord, to bless our families with the gift of salvation. We pray, Lord, show up in their lives. Turn up in ways that will bring those far from you, near to you. And we pray, Lord, you will do this also through us as children who reflect you in our lives and as parents who also imitate you in our lives. Thank you for the blessing of being connected to one another, this spiritual family we call church. And for fellowship, share, pray, and bless one another, we invite your presence in a manifest way, in a way we can experience and know and feel and even perhaps see. We thank you for hearing our prayers and for giving to us all that we have asked in accordance to your word, your ways, and your will. For we are praying together in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. To help us in our time of fellowship and reflection, here are two questions that I'd like us to give some thought to and we can speak about and pray for one another in. Where in your life would you put greater Christ-likeness, add joy to your parents or the people around you? And what similarity to God do you want to develop as a parent or as a disciple maker?